This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so let me see what we have in our kitty. Okay, so before this, we have to cover two of the components which we left yesterday. So let's do that and then we'll move on to storage. Okay, so the two components which we missed yesterday was one of them is Lambda and Elastic Bean Stack. Now let's start with Elastic Bean Stack and then we'll come back to Lambda because Lambda is a bit different and that deals with serverless component. Let me close a few of the windows I have open. So that is clean. Okay. So let's go to Elastic Beanstack. Now Elastic Beanstack is a special case of your EC2. So when you create this, you create an environment. So it's more like it's create an environment for you where you can deploy, monitor, and scale your application quickly. So it gives you a server, application server on which you would be able to deploy so that you can run your web server on top of it. So what we'll try to do, we'll try to run a application, a sample application we'll deploy and we'll running it. And it is provided in a number of different ways. So you can start a platform for PHP, Ruby's, a Windows Server 2012, Tomcat, Node.js, Python, on there are many others which you can do. So if you want an environment of these, you can spin up the environment which will give you a platform as a service. So it will create a platform for you on which you can deploy your service and run it. So it's easy way to get started. Now, it is not chargeable. It is same as what it charges you for EC2 instances. So for running your EC2 instances, and in case it is using one of the snapshot, it will charge you for that. All right, so let's start with this. And I would say, let's say Elastic Bean Demo, and I'm going to name it Elastic Bean. So this is the application name. So I'm giving a name to the application and the next is I will be choosing platforms so you can see that there are multiple platforms which I can choose from so I can go for Python go glassfish which is configured on docker or I can choose one of the docker or multi docker multi container docker which we discussed in earlier sections what docker is what the container services and then we have few others so if I want to go for go.net java node Yes, Ruby, PHP, Python, Tomcat, any one of these, I can choose any one of these as well. So Tomcat is one of the application server. Let's just select that so that we can also deploy our application. Now for deploying application, you can choose your code and you can deploy that. It may be one of the ZAR files or any, any package files which you can use. So it can be in zip format or a WAR file. What I'm doing is I'm using a sample application which I can deploy onto that. Additionally, I can create some additional configuration if I wish to but they are more like advanced versions of it if I want to do that. Okay, let me create this first and we'll go back to that. So I'm creating an application now, which is going to create an environment and this takes time. So you would be seeing that it will be putting in all the details on this black window. So it says create environment starting and then it is using a template. So this template is created on Amazon S3. So when you initiate, it this it automatically creates a number of resources for you let's see that what are those resources so what it does is it creates environment in our case it will be creating a tomcat environment and then it creates s3 which we'll be discussing later on it's a storage file automatically so these resources will be getting created automatically and then next is it will create a security group, which we have discussed earlier. So your S3 will be created, your security group will be created. Then it will also create EIP, which is your elastic IP. 
and then it will start up the environment <coughs> sorry so yeah that's what it is saying so it's gonna take some time it's saying creating environment for now and once it's finished this environment will be ready now because it creates some additional resources for you if you do not wish to keep it if you are not using it you can create it test it and later on you can delete it as well okay so we are gonna wait for some time until the time it is created and it also gives an environment id which is you don't have a control over it that's something being created automatically so that's the application which i created i gave a name application elastic bean demo and elastic band demo hyphen a and b is the environment name which is creating okay so it has also created ec2 instances now and it is starting it so elastic ip so you see that what it is actually doing is it is creating an ec2 instance it's creating an elastic ip for that it's creating a security group then it is taking files from s3 and finally it's creating a tomcat environment for us so mainly it will be running an ec2 instance with topcam environment and it will be ready to deploy any of the code which you wish to we already yeah. will have one of the sample code yeah Chris, is, is what is a tomcat environment okay so tomcat is actually an application server so we have number of application server where your code actually runs okay let me just give you a brief of that so normally what happens you will have a three-tier architecture and let's say this is how it works let me show it in the paint so that makes it a little clear so when you design a piece of code you design it in in this way so here you can consider that this is your load balancer then this would be your web server so you'll have a web server and this is true for any organization and then you will have your ec2 instances And behind that, maybe you will have your database. I'm just giving a typical scenario, so I'm not considering firewall and few other things. Okay, so this I'm just gonna make it black. So firewall is right here. Then you have your and databases. Okay, so that's the flow. So I'm just going to make all connections to make sure we know that. And this can be anything. It can be both ways as well. Similarly, this also can be both ways. okay so what i've done is this is your load balancer so your client will be here somewhere so your client will be sending a request so let's say someone is hitting a web portal web page maybe one of the shop shopping website uh, let's say amazon.com so they are accessing it which passes through load balancer which manages load balancing for your servers which comes to your web server and from your web server which is nothing but your presentation layer so this is your presentation layer from web server it goes to your application tier which is your business layer or your business rules business logic resides here and that's where you actually deploy your code so whenever deploy writes a code it is being deployed right here at this layer so application layer and then which then connects to database and gets the data from database layer or back end you can call it so this is your front end this is your back end that's where the application lives and resides so that's the layer which I was saying, which we can device like that. So that's the application. Now to create this, you need to have an environment, then only you can create your code and you can deploy your application. And this is also called as application server. Now you have different choices for application server. You can have Tomcat, you can have Glassfish, you have WebLogic, you have WebSphere. So, and they are from different, different vendors. So don't worry about that if you don't know them. I'm just giving you some of the examples. And then you can also have, uh, there is something from Red Hat, which is called JBoss, right? 
So you have number of these. So these are nothing but application servers. So this is free. Glassfish which is also free from Oracle. WebLogic free to some extent, but when you want to get the license one, then it's costly. This is from IBM. And then these two from Oracle, Glassfish and WebLogic. Tomcat is a freeware, so it's open source. And JBoss, again, it was open source earlier, but the new version from Red Hat is license one. So yeah, so these are some of the application where you actually deploy your code. So I mean, your code runs on top of it. So whenever you create a program, you want to run it, uh, you package it in as a war file or ear file, you have to deploy it in one of the application servers. And that's exactly your Tomcat server is. Uh, does it make it clear? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah, this is what we saw. So what it has done, so this process is completed. It shows health check is done. So environment, mainly our environment is created and says, so all these has been done. So pending, okay, completed, successfully launched this environment, and then it has created all the required instance. Okay, what do we have now? So it also gives you an opportunity to change it. So you can say that it's Tomcat 8.5 with Java 8 running on Amazon Linux 64 bit. If you want to change it, you can also change it. So that's a good thing. And normally when you create environments, it's not easy to transition your environment. But if you want to go for an older one, you can actually do that as well. So that's the advantage. You can change your platform. If it is latest for you, you can go back to a previous versions, maybe if required. Another, so we already have a sample application being deployed onto it, which we can check it. And once you do any changes, you can also refresh it. For example, if you are doing any changes, you want to check it whether it's being done or not, you can just refresh it. From actions, you can load configuration, you can save, con save configuration, swap environments, clone environment, restart all app servers, which is part of this, or you can rebuild or terminate environments. So terminate is like you want to delete it, rebuild when you want to make some corrections to it, restart is more like restarting all the servers underlying this Tomcat, and then these are for cloning and all other things. All right, so let's see. So this is your dashboard, this is how it looks, and then you have configuration. So within configuration, we can see the details of this environment. So we can see that what are the software available. So these are the software which is being installed by default for this environment. And instance side, it's, it has done a micro instance, t1.micro, so it's still it is good because it covers free tier. It falls in free tier, so we are good. Capacity, so single instance, so it's, it's not containing more. And because it's single instance, that's why there is no load balancer. And then you can go for rolling updates. There is a security notification monitoring as well in place. So yeah, these are the part of component as per our environment. And there is no database as of now. But if you want, if you have such a requirement, you can modify it and you can add additional as well. For example, if you want to connect to database, you can certainly do that. All right, so that was in, about environment. If, if you want to check for logs, whenever something happens, you would be getting logs here. Health, which it also shows in the dashboard. Right now it's okay, so it will be showing you okay. If it fails or something, it will be showing you that as well. Monitoring, so it has some of the default monitoring. For example, the environment which we created, it's showing you that CPU utilization is 56.7%, max network in is 7 MB, and max network out is 119 KB. So you can filter it, you would be able to monitor your environment as well. And then you can additionally set alarms which will be learning during CloudWatch and manage updates. All right, so let's go that and check for our application. And let me do a few other things. Let's me click show all for the code. Yeah, so these are nothing but the trace. We can change it to info, it will be less. So that gives you detail what was done behind the environment. All right, let me go back to my application. So this is my application and that's where it is showing that this, when it is in green, that means application is running. When it turns to red, it may mean shut down or something wrong with the environment. We can also check the application version, which is here, and this is the source. So this is the application which we deployed. Let's check for that application. Okay, that's gonna open the docs, so not that one. And let's, let me get the URL.
yeah, this one. Yeah, so it's just one of the default page which is being deployed onto your Tomcat server. Now, if you have any other war file, you can also deploy it. I'm not sure I have one, but I can check for that. So let's see if we have any of the war files. Let me see, I can try finding something. I may be having something, but I'm just looking for something smaller. Yeah, this one is smaller, I can use that. Let me deploy that. So I'm just giving you an example that if you have a piece of code and you can see that it is turned from okay to gray because it was processing. So okay means it's all good and gray means it's working on something so it was in progress and actually it is deploying my application which I have just tried to deploy it. So I'm uploading it and deploying it. Once it comes back, everything is deployed successfully. I can check for that application. So it says environment update is starting. That means it's actually taking that deployment, which I've just given. We can also check the view events, which are gonna show us what's happening. So yeah, exactly this is what is happening. Updating, let's go back to dashboard to see that. It's gonna take some time. Let's refresh and see if everything's fine. So it gives you a good interface using Elastic Beanstack. You can create a web server with no effort. So it gives you a web server and it, it will have capacity to deploy your application code. So anything you create, you package that application code, you can deploy it instantly and test it, whether it's working the way it should. So whenever you have created any of the web server application, definitely you want to run it on browser. So this gives you an environment to run that and you can test it instantly. So that's one good way. Okay, so that has come. I can hit that URL again. <coughs> Sorry. And I will do it in the new window this time. So let me do that in the new one. Yeah, and it is changed. So the first one, it was my sample application which was already there which I've chosen and then I also showed that I can choose one of my applications so this is one of the calendar application it's a small application but I did it for that and then it worked right so similarly any software any product you create a var file or ear file you can deploy it because it gives you instant access to environment and you can certainly make use of it so it's really useful when you're working uh, in a testing or development scenario, and you can make use of these servers to do it without much of the effort. So you don't have to start your EC2 instance, you don't have to worry about security and other things. Everything will be taken care of for you by this. All right, so that's a quick way. Now, as I have tested it, it makes sense that until I have plans to use it, I better terminate the environment. So I'll say terminate. And this, what it says is I'll have to put the name of the environment. So let me copy and paste. So this has been a recent addition to AWS. Earlier it was not that way, but people complain that, you know, sometimes accidentally they remove environment. So AWS has added another layer of security. So if you're cl clicking on terminate by accident, it asks you to type in your environment or type in your resource name so that it confirms that you actually wanted to remove it. So yeah, so we are deleting it. And let's see. So I'm in Beanstack. Let so me delete why it. you deleting it so that you, you don't get charged? No, so it won't be charged. It is same as your EC2 instance. So it will be charging based on your EC2 instance. So we saw that when we ran that, it created t1.micro, right? So that was the instance. Okay t1.micro so it's gonna charge you only for the ec2 instance nothing else so you're still good so we are just showing that uh, you know all these services they are all based on ec2 and but with some additions it will be doing few of the stuff automatically so that's what we are seeing all right let me okay so delete applications i'll be deleting it later on let it be there okay Let's go for another service, which is an interesting one, and it's called Lambda. Now, so we saw that 
few of the services. So we saw light sale so far, light sale, which gives you instant access to a few of the environments if you want to work with WordPress and a few other things, right? And then we discuss about container services such as Docker and Kubernetes, right? That is available as ECS and EKS. And then what we discussed now was Elastic Beanstack. That's a cool way to start your web server. Now, so, but these all are based on your EC2 instances. So it does require your EC2 instances. But there is one service within that space called Lambda. Now, although it is serverless, but it is still named under EC2 because end of the day, it runs your code. So, but it doesn't run on top of your server. It actually creates a server, it runs it, but you will not be charged for the server. So how Lambda works is, so you use Lambda when you want to test your code, but you want, don't want to create your environment. So Lambda is a serverless service, which runs piece of code, which user wants to test. So that means maybe you are a developer or a tester and you want to perform a testing or you run, want to run a piece of code, but you cannot wait for the environment to be created or maybe your environment creation is taking a long time or maybe you don't have information about creating environment. But it is a must that you should be able to test your code. You have written a piece of code maybe in Eclipse or somewhere now which you want to check on one of the virtual machines. So using Lambda, it gives you access as soon as you choose Lambda service underlying it does create ec2 instances and few other number of services for you to run that piece of code but it doesn't charge you for that so how lambda charges you is based on request so request send to lambda and processing time so you will be charged only for that amount of time so there are some charges based on request you send to Lambda to run your piece of code and then the processing time it takes to process your request and you'll be charged only for that amount. Now let's just see how that works. So let's first go to dashboard. So when you are in Lambda, you create something called functions. Now Lambda is a name and you create a function. So within Lambda service, you create functions and then functions defines what you're trying to do. So we'll be working with few of the components here within Lambda and we'll see that. But it is serverless, it is actually serverless. Let's go to dashboard first. And you can see that right now I have three functions already and it says full account concurrency. Oh, okay, let it come. So it's just updating the page. Okay, so it's a dashboard which gives you quite a good interface and it shows you all the details even about the functions, all right? So what I I'm going to do is let's create a function first and you can store code up to 75 gb so that's huge that's massive so you can make use of it so i'm going to create a function and there are three ways to create it so first one it says author from scratch that means you already have a your piece of code or maybe you can write a piece of code to test it that's one so you can name a function you can tell where it is running Right, so you can choose one of the runtime. So you can choose Python, Node.js, Java, Go, .NET, any one of these. So these are the supported ones. So you can choose one of these programming languages. You can name a function and then you can choose your roles. If it's not there, then it will be creating a role for you. So you can tell that create a role or you can choose existing role which you have created. Okay, for example, in my case, I have this role created, right? So I can say, choose, existing role and then i have chosen one of the existing roles here i can say python and i can give it a name if i give it a name then it will be prompting me to <coughs> write a python code so let's say if i say my python lambda test just creating a function okay now once function is created we can see that it is i i'll have to add additional details what are those so if i want to 
add any of the AWS resources, I can do that. But there are two services which is added by default. What are those? So this is my function. And then Amazon CloudWatch and Amazon S3, these two functions are created automatically as a part of this Lambda. Why? Because when you run your Lambda, you just need to keep a track of it. You want to trace what was happening if it is a big program. So there is a log available for that. And S3, in case you want to push something to S3, or maybe you want to download something from the S3, you can use it. Now, these are the default ones. In case you want to make use of any other service, you can certainly do that. For example, if I want SNS as well, I can drag it. Okay, so let me see the permissions. Maybe permission is a should. All right, so that is good. Create log group. Okay, so it's there. It has come actually. So SNS, it was just done. So it says configuration required. That means I'll have to configure it so that it can send alerts. So I'm not going to do that. I just added it to show it to you that you can add any of these services which appears on your left. <coughs> So that's something you can do. So you can add maybe something else, CloudWatch, or let's say CloudFront, that is. And if you want to make use of code commit so that you can push your code from there or get your code from there, you can add the services and make it part of your function. Now within this, so this is a function which you have created. Now you'll be writing a piece of code, right? But there is already a piece of code written. You can see that lambda function.pi has been written for you, which says import JSON, and then there is a line called hello from lambda. So that's already been there. So it's just a demo, and you can write your piece of code and we'll be showing you that. Now, so we already have a function written in Python. We created the Python one, and there is a hello from lambda available, which it should be printing in as soon as we run this program. So let's try running the program and see that. So how do I run it? I have a this button i can run that using that so it says template hello world okay and then it says create a new event so i'll have to create a new one i would just say python lambda test event and i'm going to say create So it has created it successfully. And now let's do it again. Now let's run it. And let's check for the details. And then it says, hello world. And we can see that this is the log from the CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is one of the services where we will be going later on. But yeah, it's a service which can put our logs so it can write logs for our services now what it has done here let's see what happened so just a small piece of code we just did hello world and it has run that code but what eventually has happened so it has used ran it for 0.34 milliseconds that was the duration for running it and build duration is 100 milliseconds so it will be charging for 100 milliseconds reconfigured so 128 mb was used in terms of resources and memory you use was 21 MB. So these are the resources which were used for running this function, a small function. And this is the log which I can say. So duration, actual duration was 0.34, but the build duration will be 100 MS because that's the minimum being possible. Right, so that is being done. And we have just run one of the sample applications and you can see your response here as well. So it's done and then all those details are appearing here. It's in JSON, so yeah, that response will be looking this way. If you write exactly as Python, then it will be different. All right, so that's about it. So you can create any of the application, Node.js and few other things, and you can run it right here. Okay. And then I can delete function when I'm done with it. So let me delete that. And then we can check one of the existing one which we have created earlier. So let's see that. Let's run one of the AWS Java and test it. 
So do remember that it charges you based on the amount of time utilized and the number of duration it is run. So this is my Java code. It exactly does the same thing. You can see that hello from Lambda, but in terms of resources, it is different. So I ran it in Python. So duration was small as well as build our duration was small. When case of resource configured, it requires more, even the memory requirement is more. Just give me a second, guys. I think someone is knocking on my door. I'm, I'm coming back. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, so that's our Lambda function, and that is something we can use when we want to run serverless application. Now, so from here, it looks quite, you know, like it doesn't make sense, you know, you just run a piece of code, but why do you actually need it? So why do we need it? It has quite a number of usage. So for example, you can work with events and you can integrate it with number of services. Let's see what are those events. So maybe you want to do something like that. So you want to create, maybe you are running one of the server, right? So EC2 instances is running and you're running your DB instance. So I'm just giving you one of the example. Now, so what you want to do based on a failure for your EC2 instances maybe, or let's say DB instances, when it fails, what you want to do is you want to trigger a mail and then you want to attach a template to it right so you can write a lambda function with piece of code and then you can attach it to sns which will send mail for you so yeah so you can run it with events and you can integrate with other services as well so you can use for number of services. Apart from that, you can do one more thing. So let's say there is a URL. So someone is sending a REST API or a URL, let's say, hitting a URL. And then that URL comes to AWS. Now Lambda can accept it. Let's say maybe in form of JSON script. Okay, and then it can fetch data from that URL. and then insert it to table. So that's something it can do. So what's happening? Someone is hitting a URL and then hitting that URL is actually placing your data into the table. That's easy. So you're passing something, you're hitting that as a part of your URL. So maybe click off a button. So someone did a click. So there's a web page where they have designed a button called click, right? And when you say submit, it gets changed to one of the URL, which goes to Lambda function. It accepts that URL, it gets all the details about the data, and then it fetches that data from that URL and then inserts it into the database. So you can easily do that. But what you're doing is you have a database here. So one of the servers, which is running your database, and you have something for the processing, but your server is not running for that. So it is just utilizing Lambda which is a serverless program. So you are saving one of the servers. So there is no requirement to run that server for 24 hours. Instead, your Lambda function can be called on ad hoc basis and you'll be charged only when it is called and not apart from that. So it's an efficient, useful service and you'll be exactly charged for what you use. So that's how you can use Lambda in different combinations. So that's one of the interesting service. All right, so let's... Let's go to the next topic, which is storage. So we'll be discussing about these storage, but before that, we'll be going through few of the details about the storage and let's go for it. So mainly the concepts about storage. All right, so let's discuss about AWS storage storage and understand what are the different options and why are these different options available. 
So we have AWS infrastructure, which we have discussed earlier, but we will just review it one more time. And then we'll see what storage options should we select and how to get my data inside AWS. And then we'll go for demo and then see. Okay, so this is the foundation services for AWS, which we completely know it by now. So as a part of foundation services, we have compute, we have storage, database and networking so compute storage database networking so compute is something which we discussed during last few sessions about ec2 about light sale about numerous other services as a part of compute a storage is where we'll be moving into now and we'll be discussing the different components different services available within a storage later on we'll be moving to database and then we'll be discussing about databases the different databases it supports and then networking now, so foundation services is one where all these four platform comes in. And then we have AWS infrastructure. That's where your regions, availability zones, and edge locations comes into picture. Now, regions, as we said, locations across geographical geographies. So something in Europe, APAC, US, you know, South America, or one of your UK regions or any other new regions which are coming in. So any regions across the world where your AWS infrastructure is being deployed, those are your regions. Availability zones, they are within your regions and all at all availability zones, it must have at least two availability zones within a region. And it will be certainly more, it should be more than two or three. So more than one it should be because availability zones are there to provide you replication services. And then you have edge location, which is primarily used when you work with CloudFront. So this is being required to distribute content for you across the world. And this has a different location than your regions and vulnerability zones. And we'll be seeing that when we'll check for CloudFront. All right, so that's your AWS global infrastructure and AWS foundation services. So it's more like a refresh. And what we are going to discuss today is storage. Now, so what are the different options we have for storage? So we have object storage, archive storage, block storage, and gateway solution. So object is something, it can be anything. Object means your text file, one of the files, it can be images, it can be videos, about anything. So anything you call object, it can store any of your objects. So when you have such a requirement, you will make use of object storage. The next thing is archive storage, that means you use that storage only for archiving so may more like backup and restore so you want to perform such operations you have humongous amount of data and you want to put it somewhere laid back in some other backup in earlier world we used to put it in tape drives or maybe hard disk if you're working with your laptops similar to that in cloud if you don't if you're not using some data frequently over the period of time and you think that it's safe to move it in a backup and whenever you need it you can just get it back so yeah in that case we will be using archiving storage and then there is a block storage which is a smaller in size so it's much smaller than your archive and object storage but that's something which is attached to your ec2 instances so we have discussed about ebs volume that exactly is your block storage so your object storage is s3 your archive storage is your glacier your block storage is your ebs and then gateway solution is your storage gateway and what a gateway solution is when you want to when some client wants to connect their on premises to aws so they want to store their objects from on premises to the cloud they can make use of storage gateway which connects to aws cloud and and then they, they can transfer their logging objects. Okay, so first one in the list is object storage. And let's see what that is. So object storage is your Amazon S3 and it is displayed by this logo. Logo, You will see that quite frequently. So it is secure, durable, highly scalable object storage accessible via a simple web service interface. So you can access it right from your browser. And then it's secure because you can perform encryption. You have your objects encrypted in it. It's durable that you can never lose your data and it's highly scalable. So you can put your data in, you can remove your data in, and you can store any amount of data in your S3. 
Okay, now it stores and retrieve any amount of data for use alone or together with AWS services. So you can just put it on your S3 or you can also integrate your S3 with other services. So these are some of the features which is being provided by your S3. So it's durable, it's available all the time. So high availability, low in cost and it's scalable. It provides high performance, it is secure, it is integrated, so you can integrate it with other AWS resources, it's easy to use, so manageability is easier. Backup and archiving is what you can use when you're working with glaciers. Big data analytics, you can use for that. Static website hosting, you can use it for that purpose. And disaster recovery is what you can also do using S3. Content storage, distribution cloud native application data. So you can do all these things using your S3. Now, so the, sometimes, most of the time, often question comes in, what is the difference between S3 and EBS then? So you can store your data even on EC2 instances. So you have EBS, you can do it there. Then why do you need S3? So first difference is web interface. So you can access your S3, which is object storage from your browser, while you cannot do the same for EBS from your browser because it's it's file system interface, so there is a difference. So S3 is object storage, while EBS is block storage, and S3 you can access through web interface, while EBS you access through file system interface. So you'll have to log into the server to access and see the contents inside it. Okay. Then Amazon S3 is scalable as well, while your EBS is not easily scalable. And why does it say it's not easily scalable? Because S3 is more like auto scalable. So you don't have to do anything. You just keep on pushing your data and it will automatically adjust based on how much you put in. Except for one requirement that in one bucket, you can have up to five TB. So that's the only requirement. But if you want beyond that, you can again create another bucket. So that's the only thing. But in EBS, it's not that way and we have seen it. So if you want to increase the size, you will actually have to go and do it there so it is scalable but it just says not easily because you ha have to go and manually do it and then s3 can also be used for static website hosting while your ebs can be used for maybe database installation or one of their app application installation you can use it for those purposes now s3 is also known as cloud storage or reduced redundancy storage so that means in terms of the durability so it provides you durability, it replicates, it can replicate your storage, which you have stored across different regions. And then that way it provides you really high availability. You can never do, lose your data. Now EBS is required when you deal are dealing with input output operations. So there are more number of read write operations you make use of EBS. So that's the difference in terms of these two storage. Okay, so what we do with Amazon S3, so what are the advantages? So we create buckets, that's the first thing. So whenever you want to store anything within S3, you have to create buckets. So that's the first thing. So you create and name a bucket that stores data. Buckets are the fundamental container in Amazon S3 for data storage. So that means without the bucket, you cannot store it. So first thing you do in your S3 is create a bucket and then you start pushing in your objects inside that. And then once bucket is created, you can put your folders, zip file, directories, images, videos, any, anything about it, whatever you wish to. But yeah, first step is create your bucket. Now store data in bucket. So you can store infinite amount of data in bucket and you can upload any number of objects, except for the case that so, it should not go. The yeah. So buckets are like uh, tables that you store data in uh, right? No, so it's like a container. So it's not. It's, you can consider bucket more like a directory. So it's not a directory, oh, okay. but in Amazon you call it container. Uh, so mainly bucket. So it's you can consider it container. So like like your bucket at your house, right? If you have a bucket or a drum something, and you want to fill in water, you can fill water in that in your bucket. So similar to that, you have to create your bucket first, and then you can push your objects. So understand it that way. Okay. So you have to create your buckets, then only you can upload data and each object can contain up to five terabyte of data. So if you have gone beyond five TB, then you have to create another bucket. And yeah, there is one more restriction which is not being mentioned, but within a bucket, you can have up to hundred different files. All right, and then you have download data. So once you have anything stored in S3, you can download it anytime so that 
that's one greatest advantage. Anything you have stored here, you can download any anytime. And if you have made it publicly as accessible, then you can also access it from anywhere, wherever you have access to internet. And then there is permissions. So you can also set permissions in S3. So you can decide who should access your S3 buckets and who should not. You can also set it based on objects. So you can decide it for objects, whether people should have access to it or not. Now you have different levels of access. First level access is that it should be only with you. That means you are the only one who should access it. That means private. And then another one could be that item belongs to you, but then you are giving that access to the other accounts. So there are a few other people who are part of your account and you are giving them access because they have to work with something. That's another way where we are is like organized. And then there is a public one. That means once you make it public, it's available to everyone. So anyone from the internet, if they have that URL, they can access it. Yeah, but if they don't have it, of course they can't. But the public means it's available to everyone. And then you have standard interfaces. So you can work with REST or SOAP APIs and you can fetch your S3 from there as well. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so that's about advantages which we have from S3. And now we'll be looking for a few of the use cases. Now you can see an example of Smug Mug. That website is actually running on S3. So we do have something called a static websites. So you can run website on top of S3, so you don't need a server. That's another important thing. Similar to Lambda, but Lambda is a function, while your S3 can run static websites. And it's a good thing, it can really do that. So it's good for a number of people, and there are a few clients who have done it. So SmugMug has done it, Redfin, which is a real estate company, they are running it on top of S3, even your net they are running it on top of S3. So yeah, there are quite a number of different companies. They are running just on S3. They don't need servers anymore. So if you have such a requirement, you can certainly do that. For streaming services, you can use S3. Now, so within Amazon S3, what are some of the components of that? So we have something called buckets, which we just explained that you have to create buckets. Then we have objects, we have keys, regions and amazon s3 data consistency model so that's something we choose when we create our aws and these are the different components which we have to consider so we'll go more in detail about this so first one is buckets and objects so bucket is like a container as you can see that there's a bucket and then inside that you can see a circle a square a triangle so it's more like objects which you're putting in so bucket is a container for objects is stored in amazon s3 Every object is contained in a bucket. So you place everything there. Objects are fundamental entities stored in Amazon S3. An object consists of object data and metadata. So object data is actually the actual data, while metadata is information about your data, which you are placing. So like uh, the date it was placed in, the time it was placed in, uh, the act permissions such as it is private, public, or accessible. So all those kind of details, and then how how it has to be backed up, so all those details. Now, an object is uniquely identified with the bucket by a key name and a version ID. So whenever you place an object within a bucket, it will have a key name. So there will be a key name and a version ID automatically assigned to it by AWS. Right, so what's the purpose? So it organizes Amazon S3 namespace at the highest level, your bucket. So that will be at the top followed by you will have rest all inside bucket. You can also identify account responsible for storage and data transfer charges. So if you have a main account and you have created multiple accounts within that main account, and if you want others to manage this S3 for you, that's something you can do that. And play a role in access control. So you can also decide who should have access to, and you can also generate reporting as well using that. Okay, so that's about buckets and objects. Next is keys and regions. A key is a unique identifier for an object within a bucket. So that means whenever a bucket is created, it will have a unique key assigned to it. That's something AWS does it automatically. Now, every object in a bucket has exactly one key. So it's one-to-one -one relationship where one object will have just one key. Now regions, you can choose the geographical region where S3 will 
store the buckets you create. So that's something you have to decide. So when you create it, you can assign it to any one of the regions which you see, I mean, not on here on the screen, but even on the portal. So in AWS, whatever regions you choose, your S3 will be applicable for that. Okay. Now, amazing S3 data consistency model. Now, just pay attention a little because this may get a little tricky in terms of wording. So Amazon S3 provides read after write consistency. So that's a consistency, which means read after write for puts of new objects in your S3 bucket in all regions with one caveat. So that means whenever you paste something, when you whenever you play something for the first time, you cannot access it until it is written to S3, which is a truth for, for everything in this world. But there is one caveat. So one with just one exception and what is that so and that caveat is if you make a hat or get request to the key name the bucket key to find if the object exists before creating the object amazon s3 provides eventual consistency for read after write so what does that mean that means you know even uh let's say you have placed an object and you have deleted it or you know place another object maybe so what s3 does it it still, if, even if it doesn't exist, it gives you the previous version's detail of it. So that's what it does. So yeah, that's the only caveat which it has. Now, it also gives you puts and deletes overrides in all regions and updates to single key are atomic. That means you won't be able to change it. So that's that's a base. OK, so the, how does it look? So in terms of Amazon S3 name space, your Amazon S3 is right at the top, as you see. Then comes your bucket. So you create you can create number of buckets inside your S3. Then you can create number of objects within your bucket, and it forms that hierarchical structure. Okay, now in terms of protection, as we know, S3 is also secure. So what makes it secure and how it is secure? So it has two types of encryption available. One is server side and another is client side is encryption. So server-side encryption is we request Amazon S3 to encrypt your object before saving it on disk in its data center and decrypt it when you download the object. So that means we have to request it to the server. So mainly you will be telling Amazon to encrypt it for you. And what Amazon does it when it stores in the disk, it encrypts it and then it stores it in the disk so that you know that information is actually hidden. It's an encrypted format. And when you want that back, they will decrypt it and then when you download it, it will be decrypted and you will get back the decrypted one in the same format you submitted. While there could be something called client side encryption, what does that mean? So you don't request Amazon for that, AWS for that. Instead, you are taking care of encryption. So you buy a key for yourself and then you say that you will perform encryption. So you have two ways to do it. So if you're doing client side encryption, either you can have a client side master key so you can buy something on your own or if you don't have if you have not bought it from any other place then you can buy it from aws itself so aws has a service called kms key management service which is called which manages customer master key so you can buy it from there so that aws can manage it for you <coughs> sorry so there are two ways which you can perform the encryption now so you can use server-side encryption with Amazon S3 managed keys, which is called SSE3, or you can do server-side encryption with AWS KMS managed key, or you can do server-side encryption with customer-provided keys. So there are three choices. First one is default, which is being available as a part of S3. Next one is you tell Amazon that you want to buy a key and you buy it and it's chargeable. So once you order a key, it will be charging you for the key. And the next one is customer brings its own keys and then they encrypt it. So these are the three different ways you can do it. So, so among the three, which one is most popular? Uh, your voice was uh, breaking. Can you repeat that, please? I said among those three choices, which one is most popular? All right. So yeah, that again depends upon client to client. This is what we use mostly. Because anyway, once it is your account, you know that nobody can hack it, so it should be with you. But if you think that there are people, you know, bad people in the world who can have access to your account and they can hack it, then maybe you can also use key, which is 
addition to this one. So this is more like a default one. When you place it, it is already encrypted, which Amazon manages those keys. But if you want to buy, if you, and these two actually depends upon organization. So if they want to go for it, then customer goes for its own keys. They buy it from some other client and then they place it. And then few of the customers, because they are already placing it in, in AWS, they prefer to buy it from AWS itself. Yeah, so like I said, this is mostly people are using. And uh, this one, if they trust AWS for both, for the data as well as keys, they do that. Few clients, they prefer to keep data on AWS, but they want to buy keys from some other vendor. So they can do that. So yeah, it depends upon choice to choice. So nothing as, as a hard, fast rule, but yeah, different scenarios, uh, uh, you can go for different options. But this one, like I said, it's more like default, which AWS manages it. So even if you are doing it, it is doing it for you by default. Okay, so now we have three options which we can see. So we have SSES3, so how does it work? So when you have a bucket, it will give you a lock by default. So there will be a master key, which will for key management, so monthly rotation for that, there will be a master key created. And then for per object, it will have a per object key. That's how the Amazon S3, SSE S3 works. And then your data will be encrypted to the outside world at the bucket level. So that's for Amazon S3, how it works. And then you also have something called reduced redundancy storage, and that is within S3. So now when you create S3, there are a number of choices, even while creating S3. We will see that, but I'll explain it for now. You have something called standard, for which there is no charge. And I think there is something called S3 standard, i.e. something will see that, uh, which is more like a bit chargeable. And then you have S3 reduced redundancy. This is most secure, but charges higher. So mainly they have given you some choices. And that's what is called reduced redundancy storage. And what does that mean? So this, redu this reduced redundancy storage is designed to provide 99.99 I'm just showing 99, but it is 99 up to nine times. So that level of durability is what they are providing for a given year. That means, what does it say? In a year, maybe you can just lose 0.15, which is like really good with the client. So they can trust AWS on that. So they commit on that. Now, what this does, what actually redundancy does, that it stores all objects on multiple devices across multiple facilities. And that's why it's highly secure and it's highly available because let's say you store it one of the regions, AWS takes care of it and it automatically replicates that information elsewhere in some other storage devices. And then if you lose that data on your S3, they will get it back to you from other devices. And that's why they say it's highly available and they give you that percentage of durability. And they say that you can never lose a data. Right, so how do we set it? If you want to set this up, now this also we would be seeing it when we're performing demo, but if you want to do it, this is how it is being done. So you will see something called storage class and that's where you set it, your reduce redundancy. So that you can set it using that variable. Okay, so you can see, you can have three different classes of storage. You can have a standard, you can have a standard IA and reduce redundancy. So these are the three different classes which you can choose. Like I said, the standard one is a default one and you won't be getting anything charged for it while a standard IA and reduce redundancy will be charged. So they will be charged higher. Reduce redundancy will be charged the most. Okay, so that's where we would finish S3, and there are a few other topics which we are going to discuss, but, but I will wrap it up here for today, and then we will take it up again tomorrow, and then we'll be completing all of these. And once that is done, we'll be going for demo. Yeah, so we have quite quite many things to cover. So let me just make a note of what slides I have covered so far. So yes, we were on 24, so we'll be starting with 25 tomorrow. All right, and then most probably we'll finish it off by tomorrow, and then we should be able to get back to the S3, which will be our first topic. 
And then we also have some new service, which was not there earlier, but yeah, it has came in later. EFS, which again, we'll be discussing it. It, were, it is similar to your EBS, but it's a bit different. And we'll see that how different it is. But yes, so that's what we have it planned for tomorrow. Yeah, any, any questions from what we discussed today? No, I have to go over again to where I have some questions, you know, you know, most of the stuff I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I understand the general concept, but when I'm, I'll try to go over, the, I'll try to review and see if I can have some questions for you tomorrow. All right, no, no problem. So yeah, just try practicing it so that you get uh, a, a feel of it. Sure. All right, thank you. So we'll catch up again same time tomorrow and then we'll be continuing with what we are living today. All right. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye, have a good one.